Living Corporate is brought to you by Textio. Today's top talent is everywhere, representing everyone. And our work environment should reflect the level of inclusion to meet that standard. Textio achieves this in building more equitable company cultures through the language we use in our job postings. That culture is formed one hire at a time, making the words we use to reach more diverse candidates all the more important. Our advanced language insights and employer brand content is what drives our mission of inclusion. Through our industry-leading application of artificial intelligence and machine learning, we're able to widen companies' reach in finding and building upon the very diverse talent that empowers a culture of belonging. Every door should be open to every qualified job seeker. Again, that's Textio. What's up, y'all? It's Zach with Living Corporate. Look, I'm really excited. Um, Every week I know I come here and I tell you I'm excited, but I'm genuinely excited. Um, You know, if you didn't see on LinkedIn, I shared some news. So, you know, and I'll share the whole story at another time because the whole story really deserves its own podcast. No cap. Uh, But, you know, really excited because I recently announced that I was uh, moving on from my uh, old position um, at a company that I won't name here for the sake of just not giving anybody any free marketing or publicity. Um, (laughs) But as most of you know, I exited um, consulting, right? I was at PwC. Before I was at PwC, I was at Capgemini. Before that, I was at Accenture. Um, I exited consulting to get into industry. I was in tech and, you know, was there for... You know, going on, what was that? I guess going on like a year and a half or so. It had to be like a year and a half. Anyway, I'm really excited because I'm actually moving on to be the head of strategic growth at Diversity Inc. Uh, for those who don't know who, what, who Diversity Inc. is, actually what you can do is you can listen to last week's episode because we actually interviewed the CEO of Diversity Inc., Carolyn Johnson. Phenomenal conversation. Make sure you listen to it if you haven't. I'm looking at the numbers. I see that. Folks are definitely listening to it, but always folks, more folks can. So make sure you take that episode, listen to it. If you missed it, share it with a friend if you missed it. Um, but I'm really excited. Um, I'm really excited for a bunch of different reasons, especially as I celebrate and kind of like repivot into being the father of two children, two lovely little girls. Um, and just, you know, get to this next phase of life, right? Like, I, it's just, it's really cool. Um, it's a great opportunity, I believe, for not only myself, as like Zach the individual, but for me, who's looking to build and continuing to grow something that frankly was inspired by diversity. Inc. And I told Carolyn this last week. And so really thankful for that. Really excited about that. Excited about the holiday season and just excited about the the, uh, the leaders that I continue to have the pleasure to to meet with and engage and network with and strategize with. You know, I'm really, really eager for you all to listen to this episode, this interview that I had with Donald Thompson, who is the CEO of the diversity movement. And, you know, there's all types of conversations that we are having um, on Living Corporate. And frankly, this work can be really draining. And and I say that lovingly, right? Like, I'm thankful for all of our guests. I know that they come to me with like a lot. Sometimes they're coming to the interview with a lot of stuff that they're carrying. I'm constantly carrying something, constantly tired about something. Um, and I'm also thankful for the conversations I have where I walk away and I feel lighter, right? Because some conversations are like heavy duty, like we're having, like we're, we're really going at it, you know, like we're really, you know, like chewing the, chewing the real meat, right? Of the conversation, like heavy, heavy dialogue. And, and there's sometimes though, like when you have a discussion, it's almost like you're just kind of like talking to an old friend and I appreciate those too, right? You walk away sometimes from those conversations feeling a bit lighter, than you started. And so I just want to shout out Donald Thompson because his energy, his authenticity, his, his team, like they're all things to aspire for, for any leader. And if you haven't heard of the diversity movement, do yourself a favor, check out their company, check out their content. They're creating content and creating learning materials to really help progress executive leadership, allyship, education, awareness, accountability, 
and really just making the workplace a more equitable space. And, you know, as diversity and inclusion become increasingly dirty words, like we're going to continue to need platforms and spaces that get to the nitty gritty of what organizations need to be doing to make a better place to work right to make um, your workplaces more equitable more inclusive and i'm really excited about the diversity movement for that amongst other reasons with that being said we're going to pivot into an episode of uh, workplace democracy all right and then after that you're going to hear a conversation between myself and donald thompson ceo of the diversity movement see you in a little bit Living Corporate is brought to you by Doximity. Doximity helps over 2 million medical professionals. We are the largest medical network that includes over 80% of physicians and over 50% of physician assistants and nurse practitioners. We don't take that responsibility lightly and committed to working towards a more equitable world inside and beyond our virtual office walls. If you want to learn more about Doximity, check out your app store at D-O-X-I-M-I-T-Y. That's D-O-X-I-M-I-T-Y. When you're building a culture of belonging, every word counts. That's why Textio brings the world's most advanced language insights into your hiring and employer brand content. Our industry-leading approach to artificial intelligence and machine learning provides the tools needed to find more diverse candidates. In short, Textio builds more equitable workspaces guiding businesses and writing more inclusive job posts. And we're building on that success by bringing even more products to the market for all people who share our belief that language matters. Words have power. And at Textio, we harness that power to increase the access and availability of value-driven work for everyone. Welcome back to the Workplace Democracy podcast segment brought to you by the Living Corporate Network. I'm your host, Tyra Robinson, an attorney licensed to practice in the state of Maryland. Thanks so much for tuning in again to the podcast segment that informs you about strategies to protect your rights as a professional employee. During this segment, we're going to talk about a topic related to our last segment, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence or AI is one way that discrimination can take place through virtual means. This arena is largely unregulated in the United States, particularly. However, the White House recently released a binding set of guidelines for the design, development, and deployment of artificial intelligence systems, officially entitled Blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, and as a shorthand, called the AI Bill of Rights. The second of five principles in the AI Bill of Rights provides for algorithmic discrimination protections. The AI Bill of Rights defines algorithmic discrimination as occurring when automated systems contribute to unjustified different treatment or impacts people based on their protected status. Your protected status is basically a status that's outlined and protected in discrimination law. So that includes, for example, race, color, ethnicity, sex, religion, age, national origin, disability, veteran status, and genetic information. The EEOC considers this type of discrimination a pressing issue and thus launched an agency-wide initiative to ensure that the use of software, including AI, machine learning, and other technologies used in hiring and other employment decisions comply with the federal civil rights laws that the EEOC enforces. You can read that full resource at the link in the show notes. As mentioned in an earlier segment, some employment Anti-discrimination laws protect job applicants and employees. AI can frequently come into play when filtering down applicants for interviews. So this is an area you should also keep in mind as a professional employee. Thank you again for listening to Workplace Democracy, brought to you by the Living Corporate Network and myself, Ty Robinson. I hope you'll tune in every segment to learn more about how to bring democracy to your workplace. Please understand this podcast segment is only intended for educational purposes and is not a replacement for individualized legal advice. You should always seek the services of a licensed attorney who will look at the specific facts of your individual circumstance if you are contemplating legal action. Additionally, the views expressed in this podcast are my own and are not reflective of my employer. Donald, what's going on? Welcome to the show, man. 
Hey, I'm glad to be here. Been looking forward to this. Okay, so look, um, I don't. It's interesting. Living Corp has been around since 2018. We've had, you know, we have over like 2,500 pieces of digital media, all talking about DEI. We've interviewed all manner of folks. We don't get a lot of black men on Living Corporate, man, believe it or not. Gotcha. It's, and I, and I, I will jump in. It's like we are out there, right? But people don't pull us forward in this space. And so I appreciate you doing that. No, I'm excited. So, you know, I. It's interesting. Um, I just I want to get right to it and talk a little bit about. I want to talk about the diversity movement. I want to talk about your company and and, and really um, the goals and what you're seeking to achieve. But before that, I want to kind of I want to ask why why you in this particular space? Like why didn't you choose you know engineering or accounting or anything else? Like what what drew you to this work? So one of the things about it, and thanks for that question, is you know. I've had a, a, a long career at this point, you know, 51 years so old and so 30 years in corporate America. I started in sales in the technology space. I uh, spent some time as a CEO of a digital marketing firm. And one of the things that occurred in uh, 2019 was I did a seminar on marketing strategies in the multicultural world. And then obviously in 2020, the entire world changed, right? With uh, the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, things of that nature. And one of the things that wasn't there in the voices from DEI is a business stakeholder and leader that has run a PL, sold companies, sold at enterprise level, that's talking about DEI in the language that the CEO and the C-suite can do. And I saw that gap in that moment, and I felt like I could fill that gap. And so that's one thing from a business standpoint. Okay. From a personal standpoint, what was my responsibility in this moment? with the blessings that I've had, with the privilege that I have, with the people that I know, and then I couldn't walk away from figuring out how to contribute in a way that really moves the needle in the business community. You know, like so look now, Living Corporate, um, what I what excites me about what we do is we, tr- we really try to have frank discussions um, in ways that just decenter white comfort um and and frankly like just like professional gentility so let me let me first off say um you're 100 percent right on point a in that there's this like space um there's this deep there's there's almost like a business in making diversity equity inclusion um hard to understand so that you can then monetize um the monetize translation um, and so there seems to be like there's a group of folks out there that's like, look, we're going to just use a bunch of jargon that folks really don't understand, but we're going to just say it. And then, oh, but but hold on. Don't worry. I'm going to help you understand it. It's like you you created the problem. Like you you created the fire. You sold me a picture of water. There's a whole, I, what's going on here? So that's the first thing. Um, huge gap when it comes to, um, I think, because there's, there's a few different challenges with language. There's a there's one, there's a gap in language for actual leaders to understand. And then there's a gap in language as it pertains to um, what's really relevant to historically marginalized people and talking in a way that honors their experience. The second thing I want to name, though, is, um, you know, I'm going to say this, man. Like, now my dad, and I'm not calling you old, my dad is in his 50s. Um, and so I'm not, I have, and I have a great relationship with my dad. So I, I, I've seen great black male role models. I'm going to say, though, man, like in the corporate space, man, it's hard to find um, Gen X black men who are really out here helping like that. Like I found I've been blessed to find little pockets. But when you said it's my responsibility and I don't and I don't know what that's about. And I've had conversations with folks offline. They'll be like, yeah, I don't know. They'll be like, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Um but I just want to thank you for for that, because, again, like and I we all have our own different mechanisms, ways we want we need to survive. But like um, to say, hey, I'm going to actually step in. I'm going to do this work. It's not a comfortable. It might not even be the most necessarily the most immediately lucrative thing. But I see a, I see own, I see a ownership lane here. So that's awesome. Let's keep on going. So in this space, the diversity movement, why the name the diversity movement? Yeah, so very, very important and impactful, right? Because we wanted our name to illustrate that we're moving the needle, right? We we are not doing this work 
right, to check a box. We're doing this work to move organizations forward with movement, measurable results, right, and a mindset shift. And so we wanted that to be in the name so that every day we wake up, every day we talk, right, it creates that kind of, that feeling in what we're doing. Second thing that is really important is when you think about movement, you think about momentum. And how do you create momentum in something? Is you get people to pay attention, engage, right, on a high level of frequency. So one of the things that we did in, in terms of building out our product suite and what we're doing is we wanted to create tools so that people could continue with their diversity movement in their organization even after we leave. Our goal is not to be a large consultancy where we're billing hours for dollars, right? Meaning we've got to find and create more work versus create capacity building within organizations with leaders and we leave our tools behind to make their work easier in a tough environment. You know what's exciting too about that is like, and I think this is where like the sales tech and business background come into play from what I'm observing from you is like these models where you come in and you just build, 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 or even if you're trying to sell B2C, like there's a limit to that, right? Like, like, and, and there's a limit to that as it pertains to your bandwidth and what you, what you can actually do. But what I'm seeing, especially as I look at the diversity movement and I look at y'all's like y'all have coursework, you have things to your point that you can one that are things that you can like to can kind of continue forward, but also things you can leave behind, which then creates ongoing relationship. But I really like that. Um, and it's and frankly, it decenters Donald from being the czar or hey, you have to talk to me and really empowers the business to like move forward so that's really dope i guess i'm trying to understand a little bit more though like when it comes to the content itself like you know like i said earlier there's various types of approaches um there's like shame-based content right so you think about like your robin d'angelo's of the world S side note let me so don let me tell you a story man. so <laughs> i'm into it <laughs> all right so live in corporate live in corporate we have a um we have a, a partnership with linkedin learning where we license some of our content and then they, and we help them repurpose it into e-learning. Um, and it's been great, uh, but there was a story a couple years ago, I guess it was like a year and a half ago where like Robin D'Angelo's, some of her courses got turned into e-learnings on LinkedIn learning and it created a whole problem for all like diversity, equity, inclusion content on LinkedIn. I had an initial scope of so many courses and they cut that scope in half mm. because of the fallout of the coursework. So they actually, we had a whole conversation about it and they said, look, Zach, we're pushing more, you know, some of your content is really on the left and we're pushing more for the conscious middle. That was the language they used the, or the mindful middle or something like that. And I said, okay. And so I say all that to say, what is your barometer and how do you choose the tone and the the timbre of your learning content? What informs that? All right, thank you very much. It's a powerful question, right? Because what I decided as a business owner and leader is my lane wasn't going to be the shame-based content, but here's why. Number one, that's someone else's lane. And people are doing it very, very well in many cases, pushing the envelope and the movement, right? Got it. My lane is to create movement with that middle-aged business leader seeking to understand. So that's why in our organization, I don't talk about white privilege. I talk about privilege. I have privilege because I was well educated. My parents moved from Bogalusa, Louisiana, paper mill town to stores, Connecticut, and me and my sister had much better schools. I had the advantage of having two parents in my home until my early 20s. Those are privileges. When I talk to white people about that privilege, now we are having a conversation about privilege. When I say white privilege, I'm losing part of the crowd. That's just one example. I also am very, very focused tonality-wise of linking my discussion around diversity, equity, and inclusion to the business outcome that that leader seeks. So now I'm thinking about DEI not as a social justice platform only, but as a driver for better business. And so I was very intentional as an entrepreneur to figure out the business lane that I could create for ourselves that would impact those that aren't really ready to hear 
about the things that they don't fully understand or makes them uncomfortable until they trust you. And once that trust is built from that conscious middle, which is an accurate place of where I sit, then I can go to different layers because I'm trusted. And number two, I'm talking to the top of the organization, the CEOs, the boards, the head of marketing, X, Y, Z. And that's been a big part of our strategy. You know, there's something to be said also about like, we've had various conversations and I think there's something like, I don't know, I think it's just intellectually designed. It's when you start, when you always frame DEI as grassroots, because ultimately, eventually, all of that effort and activity is going to get rolled up into somebody who is not on the grass, okay? And so it's important to have buy-in and engagement at the decision-making level. Um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, my, my my impression, Don, you can tell me if I'm wrong. Like, I, you know, we just got, we just met. I feel like you're like a pretty easygoing guy. Uh, you seem like a nice man. Um, have there ever been a moment where people have kind of pressed you or tried you and you've had to be like, hey, don't let this very nice polo fool you up? Hey, listen, so one, <laughs> I love your questions. I'm having a good time. Um, I'm the son of a football coach, mm. a former Division One athlete. Mm-hmm. If we need to get into it, we can get into it at whatever level we need to do it. <laughs> right? like yeah. we can, at whatever level we need to do it. Right. But I had to decide as a black professional. Yes. I had to deliver myself in a way where I could be heard most people. So I had to purposely think about how do I language things so I don't come across as that black man with a chip on his shoulder. Yeah. I had to purposely determine, was I going to respond to every microaggression that I heard or was I going to be selective and smart about that? I had to create some professional toughness so that I could be in the room, stay in the room, and then learn to navigate the room and then finally bring others into the room. But if I overreacted to every microaggression, those are things that allow people to typecast you. So I had to be smart. It doesn't mean that I don't have the same emotions, feelings, perspectives, anger points based on my lived experience. I'll give an example. My number, right, is seven. And that number is seven very painful, very aggressive interactions with the police. That's my number. Other friends of mine from Baltimore and different places, their number's higher, but my number's seven. I have some real experience. But I had to force myself to not think that all police officers were that way. And so I trained myself to be a little bit more open-minded and let people create their validity of who they were with me based on their actions and behavior. And that thought process is, has helped me. And I'll tell you, my, my dad is that knock a brother out first type dude. Like, he, I, I've grown up, like I, I've seen it, his brothers and, and how they grew up. Yeah. And my mom was more intellectual and more thoughtful in the why of things. And so I'm the blend of those things is what I would oh. describe. So anyway, I've oh. talked too long on that point. But you no, know. you didn't talk too long at all. It's a podcast. <laughs> um, so let me, so let me ask the follow up to that is, was that always kind of like your, okay, so you talked about your age, you're 51 years old. I'm 32. Do you feel as if like, I'm at a point, and I've had a com- I've had conversations with like past supervisors who are like in- who are actually your age. Um, one who is a black man, uh, whom I looked up, who I who I really what's the word I I appreciate and I admire. Um, and he reminds me of you in that regard because you're, you know, he's like, look, I'm mad, or I'm, mad, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna telegraph my anger. I'm not gonna telegraph my frustration in this moment. Most times, it got to be egregious. I guess my question to you is, did that come with time or like by the time you were in your thirties, were you pretty much out? Were you already pretty much there? It, it came with time. Like, I don't, I don't want to create a perspective that I've always had it all together. I've had to learn as a leader, how to navigate emotions versus economic outcomes, right? I've had to learn how to, in giving and receiving feedback, how to listen first, ask more questions before I developed my thought in front of you, right? And by asking that second or third question, it gave me the ability to be more on point when I did speak, right? It gave me the ability in, in over time. And one of the things that really helped me is being in sales and being in enterprise sales. So I've, I've worked on um, 
business relationships all across the world, whether it's India, Germany, France, all across the U.S., different size companies, manufacturing technology. And there's all these different flavors of folks that I had to develop trusting relationships with in order to earn the right to ask them for money. And that, that skill set helps shape me using words and language and, and tonality uh, to be more effective with people. And that's ultimately, and I'll say this, that one of the disservices I think that we do to, to our people, people of color, black and brown people, is we don't spend enough time on our personal responsibility in this moment. Hmm. Right? Because the world is going to change at the world's pace. But we control how we teach our young. We control the readiness and the, and the nuggets of knowledge and wisdom that we pass on. We control whether we have that extra cup of coffee with a young black professional and give them that guidance that we need that they may not be getting from that supervisor. And so I do have a, a perspective of how do we do more while we're waiting on the world to catch up. And I know it's frustrating because we, we often don't want to take more responsibility for what should also be available for us as a part of the American dream. But then we have to have that reality check and say, we are more equipped in this moment as black professionals than ever before in our history. And so the lack of unity sometimes is a, is a, is a, is a roadblock to our progress, as well as the systematic things that we have to address. It's just so wild that we're having this conversation today. It's interesting, man, like in this D in and outside of this D in this entrepreneurial DEI space. But yeah, what I'm learning and what I've, I've, I feel like, like it was like about a year and a half, again, like another year and a half ago, I said, man, I came to the realization of like black and brown folks. And I'm going to specifically talk about black people in this moment is we're not going to be able to do this, practice the same capitalistic, like hyper scarcity mindset tactics that the majority, the white folks practice, because there's so few of us and compounded by the reality of systemic oppression and racism. So like we can't, we can't be out here. It's me versus you. No, it just, it just doesn't work that way. We're not, we're not going to collectively survive like this hyper individualism. That's part of, um, uh, the, the westernized colonized world. But it, those, those systems, those beliefs, those attitudes, they're not, um, first of all, they're not healthy, period. We can look at the economy. We can look at the world and see that model isn't really globally sustainable and not, but, and it's certainly not sustainable for historically oppressed, systemically marginalized people. And so like what it looks like in terms of, you know, a hundred percent, there's, we don't, I don't know. I agree. Like, I think there's like a lack of owned or uh, responsibility or sense of, Hey, even if we can't necessarily break bread together, there's nothing that should stop me from sharing a contact or retweeting something or putting you on my website or, you know, like, 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 it doesn't mean, like, it doesn't mean we have to literally sign, we don't have to sign documents, we have to be incorporate together, but we have to figure out a way to practice some sort of, like, barter system of support, because we all we got, you know? And you mentioned it, right? It's as simple as, how do we network together? How do we share a lead, an insight? And more important, and equally as important, right, is how do we highlight examples of what's working and what's good? and not waiting for that media narrative to do that, but we can do that with the platforms that we have, whether you're a deacon in the church, whether you're a teacher in the school, and what guests do you bring in for career day, right? First, you have a platform, or I do on our LinkedIn and different things. What things do we just cheer and amplify for so that we have that beacon of hope that we all see, and we all need, because this work is hard, and there are days where you don't feel like pushing through, uh, but you know we, we choose our paths, and we got to continue to make that path hundred percent. Um, Donald, look, man, we could talk all day. Like, you know, I, I appreciate you. Clearly I'm a fan. Um, I was already excited to connect with you. We talked a little bit offline. So I'm excited to kind of connect with you, but I'm really digging the work that you're doing. I'm excited to see, um, a black man in this space who, um, who has a sense of community and ownership and accountability about themselves. It's, it's encouraging. It gives me hope. And as I think about like my generation, really coming right behind y'all it lets me know that like you know it's not all is not lost um let's let's do this though before we before we wrap up 
you know, again, you're talking to executive level leaders every day that the diversity movement is really pivoted and focused on top level leadership, policy process, uh, setting people and orgs. Talk to me about like the top three things. You know, we're looking at this economy, folks are getting let let go. Um, there's challenges and pressures and anxieties around pending recession. And, you know, one of the first things to go in these moments is always DEI, people ops roles, recruitment roles. Let's say you're in a room full of like 20 executives and let's just let's say Fortune 1000. Um, and they're all trying to figure out what they need to be focused on, what they need to be doing this month. What are the three things you tell them? So number one is the executive education uh, around diversity, equity, and inclusion so that you learn how to be a more inclusive leader. Because leaders have the ability to amplify their behaviors, their mindset, their voices throughout organizations of thousands. Right? So that's number one. The second thing is to equip your learning and development team, your DEI leaders, with tools and technologies that give you scale. Right? So here's would be the shameless TDM that we work with executives, but we have a Netflix for DEI, which is basically 500 micro videos on DEI topics that allow organizations to have a subscription. They just plug in the question and a two to three minute vignette comes up that's expertly curated. That allows DEI to drive within the organization and scale. So the tools for your DEI leader. The third thing that I think is super important that I would tell these executives is that it is very important the education of your mid-level people managers that are at the tip of the spear because DEI and belonging at work is one conversation at a time with your frontline manager. And if your frontline managers aren't bought in, educated and trained, anything you do is going to have limited success because that's where the, the majority of employees live. That's the majority of the employee experience is the tone and the environment that mid-level people manager sets for those. I'm going to push you. I'm going to push one. I'm going to push on the other side. You got Gen Z. They're coming in. Whole new. <laughs> <laughs> and they, I got and they don't give a damn, all right? They, they, they over here, they messing stuff up. It's so funny. It's so funny watching, um, because millennials are turning 40 now. So, you know, we are no longer the new hotness on the street. And however far folks kind of like think uh, millennials push the envelope and stuff, we can. Now, I'm not saying we don't. We can. And, and we, uh, some of we, we do. But Gen Z, though, Gen Z is different. Talk to me about the three things you believe <laughs> leaders need to understand. Because because when I think about executive leaders, they're all frankly like in their late forties to mid fifties, uh, Donald. Like they're really in, they're really your your demo, right? Your 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 generational demo. What are the things you believe that they're missing in this moment to really engage and maximize on that talent? So, all right. So I'll, I'll say this: um, one of the things I do to try to really understand different groups that I'm not. Uh, a part of that affinity group. Gen Z, I had a podcast with four to five Gen Zers and I just asked them a bunch of questions because I wanted to learn, I wanted to understand in this moment. A couple things that they came up with that they shared, I'll share with your audience. Number one, they want to be heard. They know they don't have all the right answers, but they want to be heard. Number two, they are very particular about the social stance and presence of organizations they join organizations they buy from. Number three, they also understand that an economic engine drives their goals and future as well. So they're not as um, rose-colored glasses as one would think, but they expect to be heard, realize all their ideas might not be the right ones, but they want to be at that table. The second component that's really, really important is that they have a high expectation that the companies they represent are impacting, right, the environments that they're in. And here's the thing. If they don't feel like they're getting what they need, they will bounce. Like, like you can, like they, like they will, they will disappear, right? And so as managers, what I would share is that you do have to listen to these employees more intently and realize the, the gap in their experience doesn't mean they don't have the ability to create high impact, but you do have to build in management and leadership time for more listening than you're accustomed to when Gen Zers 
are not used to command and control. They're used to a highly collaborative environment, and then they'll go do really, really good work. But if they're just dictated to, they will not feel that emotional tide of the organization. And it's a hard balance for those of us that were raised in a different way, but that generational diversity is one of the challenges because we've got all different generations now that are actively in the workplace. Dama, look, man, we, like I said, we can keep going. I appreciate you. Um, thank you so much. I'm excited about the diversity movement. I'm excited about, uh, frankly, just the work you're doing and what you bring to it, because there's plenty of brands out there that may claim to do similar things. Um, but you're coming to it with a very approachable practicality that I I believe is genuinely missing in this space and your brother doing it. So I, I, I have to, I have to show love. Um, any shout outs, man, before we let you go. Thank you for that, for that space. Um, a few years in the making, uh, in October, I have a book that is launching. And the title of that book is Underestimated, A CEO's Journey in Corporate America. And it really tells my story. And there's a lot of funny stuff in there. There's a lot of meetings that didn't go amazing. There's a lot about me, my family, but even more importantly to your audience, how did I navigate those things to create some levels of success? And that's what we get to share uh, in, in the book. The other thing that I would share is that the diversitymovement.com has a ton of free resources. We are a for-profit organization, but we are mission-driven. And so we understand that every business, every leader doesn't have the same budgetary options. We want to create great content so that no one is left behind. And so I encourage people to go to our site and consume our newsletters, consume our best practice guides, our free videos. And, and we'll do what we can to keep that great content freely available uh, and, and help the best that we can. I love it. Donald, with the diversity movement, we'll talk to you soon, man. You're a friend of the show. you got to come back now. I'll do it. All right. We'll talk soon. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me, Zach. And we're back, yo. I want to thank Donald Thompson again. Shout out to the whole diversity movement team. Shout out to the crew. Shout out to shout out to these PR agencies that be hitting us up. You know what I mean? Like they're getting better. You know what I mean? Y'all are getting better at like trying to source folks and asking, you know, some of your clients to come on. So shout out to y'all. One day though, we're gonna talk to talk about y'all too. We've had a couple of conversations about these PR agencies reaches out to black owned platforms asking us to do their marketing for free. Uh, but <laughs> when it works out, it works out. And Y'all are starting to recognize y'all can't just do all this for free all the time. You know what I'm saying? You know, because and look, everything, you know, and I'll say this as an aside for black entrepreneurs, you know, value isn't only communicated in dollars, right? There may be serious moments where doing something for a look can be a really good look, right? So I don't want to say, hey, if they're not paying them, you automatically say no all the time. At the same time. We all know that everything costs, right? So it's blowing my mind that in 2022, I'm talking to other people, like other black entrepreneurs, other black founders of like who have really great brands, like brands that I look up to, brands that I respect. And they're telling that we're trading war stories about folks asking us to do work for free. It's just like, goodness. And I don't know if the folks just don't realize it's racist or just if they don't, they're not processing it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But anyway, that's a podcast for another time. The point is, shout out to the diversity movement. <laughs> and uh, hey, if you haven't already, make sure you give Living Corporate five stars on Apple Podcasts. Some of y'all hit me up and be like, what can I do to support you? I'm like, yo, I'm promised. Some of the things you can do to support Living Corporate are like free of cost, right? And take maybe like two seconds. Go to Apple Podcasts, go to our network and give all of our shows five stars, right? That's the easiest way to support Living Corporate. It's immediate, it's tangible, it's meaningful. It helps us in a variety of ways that you don't even know. I promise that's great. If you want to make sure that you keep up to date on all the things that Living Corporate is doing, from the research it's publishing when it's partnership with Blind, to any new news and upcoming partnerships, to upcoming series that we're doing, to new jobs on our job board, make sure you actually create a profile on living-corporate.com, right? Then you can be notified of all the things that are happening with us as a company, as a network, right? We're not just a podcast. We're a whole network. I know some of y'all joined, some of y'all are long-term listeners, right? And when y'all joined Living Corporate, y'all joined this as a singular podcast, but that was like four, almost five years ago, 
right? Since then, we've actually grown into an entire network of shows. We have all types of stuff that we're doing now. And so it would behoove you, you know what I'm saying? To like create a profile for free on living-corporate.com and just check us out. You know what I mean? All right. I love y'all till next time. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.